Good morning and welcome. So yesterday we started with the Lex Friedrichs method, which is another method to solve the linear detection equation. And let us just repeat that. So the method is named after Peter Lex, who got the Hubble Prize some years ago, and Friedrichs, who was a co-worker of Richard Schumann. In the case, is the F in the CFL condition. So the method was the following. We take the value at a new time level minus, we have the time derivative, we take the average of the values at uj plus one n and uj minus one n. So that is then Usually we had the uj. So this is the special trick with this method that they take this average instead. And then the spatial discretization is just done by a, a centered difference. So we have uj plus 1n minus uj minus 1n divided by 2 delta x is equal to 0. We discussed. Uh, how we can treat the boundary conditions. One is given, that is the inflow from where the flow is coming, if it's coming from the left, so the left boundary. But then, in that case, at the right boundary, we could use the explicit update. Now we want to write this in the form as we would uh, code it. So that can be written. If we simply multiply by delta t, then we will see that we get here c delta t divided by delta x half. So we get the current number in there. And then we also bring this on the right hand side, and we see they have those, they are same, uh, the same values, operating on the same values. So then we get the following uj n plus 1 is equal to one half, if we bring that on the right hand side, uj plus one n minus plus uj minus one n. And here I have made an error, sorry for that, we just correct it, that's the problem. This should of course be plus, if we take the average. Here it is the minus is the difference, is correct, but there it should be plus. So Therefore, we have a plus here. And then we bring also the uh, difference on the right hand side and multiply by delta t, and then we will get the current number. So that will give us minus the current number, half, times uj plus 1 and minus uj minus 1. So then we can see, we can summarize and factorize the. Uh, uj plus and minus 1, and then you get the following formula, that would be 7, that we get the solution at the new time level by computing 1 plus current number half times uj minus 1n, so that is this, minus minus is that for the plus, and we have here plus 1 minus current number half, uj plus 1n. So we take a kind of weighted average, let's say, of the values at uj plus and minus 1. An interesting thing that the value ujn is not involved at all. You can show as an exercise that the truncation error of this is of the order delta t and, which is interesting, delta x squared over delta t. So that is an exercise. And this term is dangerous. We have seen that already 
in the Dufour-Frankel method that you had as an exercise when we discussed the heat equation. So that can lead to inconsistency. For example, if you would choose delta t proportional to delta x squared, this term would not go. We would, get, we would then solve not the correct equation. Of course, then the truncation error would not go to zero, as it should be. So we have to choose then, for example, that is the usual choice, delta t proportional to delta x, which is natural if we choose a constant current number. So we can remark that. So it is consistent if we do that. If we choose the current number, which is little c, the affection velocity times the time step over delta x, if we choose that constant, then, then it's okay. Because then the, the delta t will be proportional to delta x. So then we, we can get consistency, because then we get here an order delta x. So then it is first order in space and time if we do this choice. So if we have that, we do it like that, the truncation error is of order uh, delta t and delta x, first order in space and time. So we can already from the truncation error analysis see that uh, we must be careful with this. And we see even more if we do the modified equation approach. So we skip the technical details of the derivation and just write what you also find in the textbook. That is, when we solve the in advection equation with the Lex Riddick's method, we in fact solve this equation. We solve the advection equation, not correctly, but we solve something else. And we get the following, advection velocity c times delta x half. And then we get here a term 1 over the current number minus the current number. And that is multiplying u x x. And then we get another term, we get many more terms, but we only look at the first two. And that is again the advection velocity c now times delta x squared divided by 3. Now we get 1 minus current number squared, and that is the third derivative, plus higher order terms. So if we look at this, we are not solving the linear vection equation, we are solving a much more complicated equation and one that contains here something that we identified when we looked at the explicit upwind method, we had something, a similar term there, as the numerical viscosity. So this we call the numerical viscosity. But here this is even more dangerous than for the explicit upwind method. Imagine we choose a small current number, then 1 over c gets very large. And that is corresponding to choosing a small time step. Then this term also in the truncation error gets very large. So that is the danger with this method. For small current number, this method is extremely diffusive. We are not solving the equation we want, but something with a large diffusion. And you see that in the results. And this term is responsible that we also have a dispersion error, that the waves are not propagated with the correct velocity, except for, you see here, for c plus and minus 1, then this will vanish. So that is again a special, that is by the way also a special term for this. If c is 1, also this vanishes. And we can show that for c plus and minus 1, actually the method is exact, like the explicit upward method. So that's a good thing. But apart from that, the method is very diffusive, especially for the low current numbers. So let us just remark that. So both the truncation error and also the numerical.
term for viscosity on large for small for a number of small time steps. Tells a little more, even. But that means then, what I just said, we will get very intrusive results. And that is something one would not expect. If we have a small current number, that would mean that we have a small time step. And we would usually expect that they have a good resolution in time, and, uh, but it is not so. We can also do the for Neumann stability analysis with this method, and we can do that as an exercise again, and we get the following amplification factor. <coughs> From that we could do then the analysis that we did for the um, explicit upwind method. And I think I also showed it for the implicit upwind method. And we get something of the following. Again, remember the meaning. This is a polar plot, and it is that the distance from the origin to the values that we see, dependent on the angle phi, it gives us then the value of this amplification factor, g of beta. So beta is going from, from zero to phi. And then we see we are good on this side, and good on this side. But in between, we have very large damping. And you see here, this is for 0.25, and it goes even more down as we get smaller and smaller in the current number. So that is this one. And that was the indication for the uh, dissipation error. So that is now the phase angle relative to the exact phase angle. And again, we read it now, we should read it from here. So it is this distance here. It should be, this is correct for C equal one. And you see, if we choose any current number lower, which we have to do because of stability, we will note that in a minute, you see we get very large uh, uh, dispersion errors. And they get very large as we go with the current number to zero. So that is, these are clearly disadvantages of the method. But as we go closer to one, so that for, if we get closer to the solution where the method is exact, we can get reasonable results. Okay, so let us now note what I just said, that the method is uh, stable for current number smaller than one. But we can also show that from this. If we look at, if we compute the modulus of that, we 
can almost see it. We get cos cosine squared. So the model is squared, cosine of beta squared plus c squared sine squared. And then we can easily show that the absolute value of c must be smaller than equal 1 for that to be smaller than 1. So the method is stable for absolute value of the current number smaller than equal to 1. So that is what we can get also from the stability analysis. So the conclusions for this method, or maybe we can look at a result or results to give you also an impression. This is looking at the a way of identifying dissipation and dispersion errors, but we can also look at um, uh, some results. Let's see, I prepared two of them. So let's take maybe the sign first. So we want to propagate the, just the sinus distribution just with a constant velocity, in that case to the right. And so we let it go. And you see the amplitude goes down, it is dissipated. So that is that we see here clearly the dissipation error. And in that case, the current number was equal to 0 0.5. Zero, yes. And uh, you see it should be here, but this is all dissipated. We can get it better if we increase the, the current number. So that is a typical sign of a strong dissipation error that we see here. So let's look for the other example. That's a discontinuity. following. So we have um, now a distribution where we have here between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 we have just uh, 1 here and otherwise it's 0. So it's a distribution that is discontinuous and that should be now be transported just um, for a time 0 0.4 and the advection speed is 1 so it should travel c times t should travel 0.4 in distance. So in the end, it should be the, the right boundary of the discontinuity should be 0.8, the left one should be at 0.6. So let's see what, what happens. It's this what is happening. So we get uh, some strange results, um, some something like oscillations, and it is very much spread this uh, discontinuity and this is also some sign of this method it has these uh, kings there which are close to each other and that is because it does not have this uj in the middle so it doesn't couple it properly but uh, it does not explode and it does not uh, give um, um, too big oscillations they get lower if we reduce if we increase the current number then the method gets better so this is then a sign both of the, the dissipation error and also that the waves imagine to represent a discontinuity in the Fourier space we need infinitely many Fourier modes and they are all transported especially the, the ones that see in the, the large with the large wave numbers they are transported completely wrong and then we see also that we get here this effect on both sides so, that is our disadvantages of the method, but why is it nevertheless interesting? It is so simple. And when we get to more complex <coughs> problems for conservation laws, it is always a choice to try that, but one has always be too aware of the limitations. So when you choose it, try to choose it with a large current number, the largest possible, that is one. So then, then it's okay. But otherwise it's not good at all. So let us just summarize these features that we saw, both in the analysis of the amplification factor regarding dissipation and dispersion error, and from these two examples for a smooth function, a sinus wave, and for a 
this, uh, um, this continuous example. So the conclusions are that we have a very large a dissipation error with this Dax-Fridix method for the current number to zero. And that we also have a large, and it is what we saw uh, for the large wave numbers, the for the phase error, the so-called leading phase error. So it is going too fast, it's propagating waves too fast. So that's the dispersion error. And also for the current under to zero. But the good thing is it is exact for C equal to 1, that is when we have propagation from left to right, and C equal to minus 1 when we have propagation from right to left. So for the current numbers, 1 minus 1 is exact. So let's see if we can improve on that. So the method that does generally a better job than the Lex-Fredix method is the following. This is the lex wendorf method. Again, the, the Lex, and I think uh, Wendorf was his PhD student at the time. And that is derived and that is interesting in itself, which, you can use, which one can use also in other contexts, by Taylor expansion. So we have Taylor expansion um, of the exact solution of the linear infection equation, which was write the Taylor expansion, this will simply be skipped. So then we have the following. We look then at the solution at the point x and t plus delta. So we want to see what is the solution at the new time level. And then we do the expansion around x t. And we skip writing the now u of x t and so on. So then we know how to do this Taylor expansion. We get the delta t ut plus delta t square half, second time derivative plus order delta t to the power 3. So that is something that we know already from the uh, truncation error analysis that we have been doing for many schemes. Now the trick is to use the PDE to replace the time derivatives in this Taylor expansion. So we are now using uh, uh, equation 1, that is our inervection equation, and then we get that ut is equal, you see here, ut is equal to minus c less. So that is the first thing. So we can replace then this ut by minus cux. And not only that, but we can also do the following. We can look what is utt to get that here replaced. Again, we use 
the get like that. We use the exact uh, that U is an exact solution according to our assumption of the inner traction equation, and we can again replace U T by minus U C U X. We get the time derivative of that, and that we can write because uh, this is just linear. And u x t, if this is a smooth function, we can interchange the derivative order, and we get the minus c u t x. Then we can do it again like that, and we can use the exact solution that u is the exact solution. We can use that again. Again, we replace u t by minus c u x. We do that. We get here minus c u x, so we get altogether c squared, so it is again with equation 1, and we get here then the u x x. So that is the trick here. We, by that, uh, we can then replace the second time derivative by c squared times the second space derivative. So from that, we get the following two that we can then express the exact solution at point x and time t plus delta t by u and then we get here then the minus c u x so we get minus c delta t u x and here we get then um, uh, delta t or c squared right then c squared delta t squared half u x x so we replace this here by c squared uh, u x x and then we have still an error term of delta t to the power 3 what we have now replaced the Space, the time derivatives by space derivatives using the that u is an exact solution to the linear faction equation. So that is what we get now out of this. And now Lex and Wendroth discretize these space derivatives by central differences. And then we have a scheme, and then this is neglected. So let's move that. The first space derivative and the second space derivative of u with respect to x are approximated. by second order, that is what we have been discussing, central differences we get the Lex van der method. Then the following. Now we go to the discretization, and then this will be done. It will be done at the grid point x j. This will be the time level t n. So this will be then the time level uh, n plus one. So that means we will then have u j n plus one is equal to, and on the right hand side we are then on uh, at x j and tn and then we get this here central difference there will be first we write the c delta t and the central difference that will give us a 2 delta x to the denominator so this will be uj plus 1n minus uj minus 1n because we are assuming that is ux also this are at the time level Tn. And then we have also the uh, 
the other term here that is then discretized by, as we have done usually for the heat equation, just the discretization of the second derivative. So we get then the c squared delta t squared divided by 2 delta x squared. And then here we get the uj plus 1n minus the 2ujn plus the uj minus 1n. So that is the way we discretize the second derivative, this divided by delta x squared, which we have here. So, and then we see here that the current number pops up again. Two places. Here we have the current number, and here we have the current number squared. So then we can write this method in the following way. This is then what we can use when we do the coding. And you will do that, I hope, for exercise 7. Ujn plus 1 is equal to Ujn minus, now we have here the current number, half. That is u j plus one n minus u j minus one n. This one, and here we have the current number squared half times what we have there: u j plus one n minus two u j n plus u j minus one. So then we have the flux Wendell method. So now we can think what will be the order, the truncation error, what will be the order of the method. Remember, the derivation was starting doing Taylor expansion up to the order 3. But that was for u itself. If we divide by delta t, then it is only second order. So we have a, we'll have a second order in time. And the discretizations that we did for ux, we have it here, and for uxx that we have here, are both second order. So the method is second order in time and space. You can also show that just by uh, Taylor, uh, by a truncation error analysis. So let us just note that. Truncation error is of order and delta x squared. So that means it is second order, both in space and time. This, these features. So that is really good. To go further, we can again do the, the modified equation approach, apply that, and then we get the modified equation of the lux wendroff method as follows. We get that ut plus cux not really solved by the Lex-Wendorf method, but we solve the equation that has on the right hand side the minus c delta x squared 6 divided by yeah, times 1 minus c squared times the third derivative, so this is a second order term. Um, we have another term here, 
that is then minus c third order term divided by a c again one minus c squared and then we have here four fourth derivatives and higher order terms. And so on. If we would do that, anything in that. So that means we have no numerical viscosity here because we have not a term of the kind we had before, order delta x, u x x. Our first error term here gives us a dispersion error, not a dissipation error. But nevertheless, we get some dissipation if we do the analysis from the fourth. So that will give us some contribution, but not so big. If we do the von Neumann stability analysis, we will find the amplification factor. We will also do that as an exercise. It is usually a little enterprise work with that, but it can be done. And it is the following, we get 1 minus current number squared, 1 minus cosine of beta, minus i c current number sine of beta. Again, beta is k delta x. So from that, we can then take the modulus. If we do that, we find that the method is stable. So the modulus of the amplification factor is smaller equal to 1 for the absolute value of the current number smaller equal than 1. So that's the same as we had also seen for the Lux uh, Fridix method. Also here we can do a little summary of the method. And we can note that it has a fairly, well, maybe I should show you that before I write it. Let's see. We get the application vector analysis now, looking at the modulus to identify the dissipation angle and the phase angle to identify the dispersion error. So that should be that one. No. Have it? Okay, apparently. Apparently I missed to do that. Okay. Then we have to do without it. I thought I had done it. Okay. Then we can I can refer to the book. Let's see where do we have it? It is on page one hundred and eighteen in the book. And let's see, I don't we don't have it, then we drop it. And so that is for, we can note that is for curve number one. Okay. If we take uh, the smaller current numbers, let's see. I have to check. 
this here. Because apparently it goes something like that for a current number 0.75, which is pretty strange. And then for 0.5, something like that. So it's 0.5. And for 0.25 it gets close to the close to the what it should be exact value so that's a little bit uh, uh, contraintuitive because one would expect as c goes to one that it then that it behaves like that but it's apparently doing just the op the opposite of this expectation. So that is what we see here, the modulus of G of beta, giving us then the application of the um, dissipation error. And the dispersion error, that is then the phi of beta, the phase angle, divided by the exact phase angle. Again, we have here the 0, and 1, and 1, again we have beta this direction and for c equal 1 we get again the exact one and let's see and now it is apparently just the other way around so we start to get already very quickly to face the, the results for c equal 0 0.5 0 0.25 and um, the 0.5 is not much better. And the 0 0.75 is doing a better job. But it, it goes somewhere a little bit off here. So it is 0 0.75. So it is doing a good job, but for the, the very large, the wave numbers, so k when k dot x is large, then it gets even gets a, a leading phase error. Before it is a lagging phase error, it's propagating too slowly, but not as bad as for the lower current numbers. So we definitely get a phase error with the method. But they are by far lower than for the Lex Friedrichs method. Remember there we had a leading phase error which was going like this for the current number of 0.25. So, therefore we can say we have fairly low dissipation errors. Fairly low dissipation error. And we have a lagging phase error. So the phase, the our waves with the are not are transported too slowly. The lagging phase error. Except for um, current numbers square root of. 0 0.5, it's about 0 0.7 in this range here. And then it is only, as we see, for 0 0.75 for the very large wave numbers. And the good thing with this method is it is second order in space and time. And it is exact or again, current number plus and minus one. So these are the points. They are, well, they are quite good. So they have good properties. You see that 
when you do the exercise. Let's see. Here we have again now the sign transported. It should be transported over a time of two, so it should travel the distance of two to the right. So that is fairly good. Remember, the next um, that is for current number 0.5. And for the same current number, the next uh, Friedrichs method essentially damped. There's little left of the amplitude. So here it is quite good, but what you see here that uh, the weight is transported too slowly. So we have here, we are here in the region where we have a lagging phase error. That is what we have here, lagging phase error. We are not in a, a current regime where we might have a leading phase error. So it's, traveled, it's propagated too slowly. You see that here. The exact is the red one and the numerical one is behind. So for these problems it is doing a good job and you'll see, you can also show that when you do the analysis, that you will see a second order for this smooth solution. If we take another example for the discontinuous, you will see the limitations of the method. So we have it here. Again, the same problem. We have zero except uh, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4, we have one. So it's a discontinuous initial condition that should be propagated a distance 0.4 to the right in the time 0.4. So what we see we get oscillations and we get an overshoot here, so we get a smearing here and we get as oscillations here. So those are the disadvantages of the uh, Lex Windroff method when applied to discontinuous problems, then we get oscillations. And so we get here an overshoot, it's getting too large, and here it's getting too low. So we'll see in the, when we come next week looking at nonlinear equations, the inverted Burgess equation, we'll see methods where we can avoid these uh, overshoots. But it's, it's doing a fairly good job. Okay, so let's stop here and take a 15 minutes break.